very much. Uh, I really enjoy coming back to Oregon. I'm, I guess I'm doing 10 events in six different cities around the, all the way to, over to Florence and uh, Newport. And I was just in Hood River this morning. And I'm getting a wonderful uh, taste of Oregon once again. Um, I've had the privilege uh, and the great uh, enjoyment of being able to travel to Cuba 11 times over the past, uh, since 1968, so the last 41 years. And my book is based on the, that reporting experiences, including living in Cuba uh, last year for a period of time. And I, I have a question for you. How many people here have either heard the Buena Vista Social Club CD or seen the film? Okay, so most people. So you all know you all know the story, right? These um, poor and impoverished musicians who had been forgotten uh, in Cuba went in and made this CD with Ry Cooter. A later a uh, movie came out of the same name, uh, and they rose to fame and success. And they, it was a real rags to riches story and a, and a triumph for that wonderful kind of music. There's only one problem with that story: none of it's true. That is the popular myth. And the reason you've, it is a myth is because it was promulgated not when the first CD came out, but when the movie came out. And it was and part of the publicity campaign uh, at that time. Uh, they needed a backstory. They, they, they found something. And it fit very nicely with the stereotypes about Cuba. So not only everything that I just said, but also that the, the government had banned their music. I mean, there was all kinds of stuff. And, and I'm not just talking about on errant websites. The New York Times reported this. Uh, as did other major media in the United States. Well, I actually went in and checked on this because I, I had a hunch this wasn't true, but I went down on one of my trips. And I've now, over the period of 10 years, interviewed almost all of the original Buena Vista Social Club musicians, uh, and uh, the, uh, including several who have since passed away. And the reality was that there was exactly one musician, who uh, the singer Ibrahim Ferrer, who was living in very, very dire straits. He was shining shoes for neighbors. He had been a secondary singer. He was not very well known in Cuba. He had retired and was living in very difficult circumstances. One of the other musicians, Ruben Gonzalez, the pianist, uh, had been retired. He was like 75 years old, perfectly reasonable. And he was living uh, comfortably uh, by his own description. Uh, all of the other musicians were working musicians, ranging from well-known to internationally famous prior to the, release, the, the production of the CD. Uh, in fact, two of the musicians, Compay Segundo, the guy in the white suit, you know, with the cigar, and um, Eliades Ochoa, the guitar guy with the uh, 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 cowboy hat, um, had traveled around the world and had, in, in fact, been in Washington, D.C. 10 years earlier and recorded the very same music. But it was considered folkloric music, and the, it was, they performed at the Smithsonian in Washington, and the, the Smithsonian didn't even bother to issue a CD. The only time they issued a CD was after the Buena Vista Social Club became such a big hit. They went digging back through their archives and found this and then issued the, the CD. So um, it is typical of the kind of reporting that we get about Cuba that you can create virtually any myth. It then becomes widespread and, and believed, even though it has absolutely no connection with reality. Because I, I've been, I've reported, you know, I report for uh, lots of mainstream media. I report for NPR and CBC in Canada, the San Francisco Chronicle, Dallas Morning News, Christian Science Monitor. You know, so I'm very well familiar with how the mainstream media works. And basically is, in the case of Cuba, but also in many other situations around the world, there is no, if you misreport things about Cuba, there's no downside. There's no consequences. Uh, if you get something wrong, your editor says, well, don't do that again. But if you report accurately about Cuba and it's interpreted to be favorable, well, then you come under a, uh, an avalanche of criticism, particularly from the right-wing Cuba lobby and others. Uh, and, and any little minor, small detail that might have been wrong is exaggerated to show what a lousy journalist you are. How do I know this? Well, um, I, on, during one of my trips, uh, had, uh, was staying at a hotel where a correspondent from the New York Times was also staying. And we would get together in the morning and, and chat, and he'd talk about the stories that I, uh, he was doing and I was doing and so on. And very nice guy, actually very, uh, quite liberal. If I mentioned his name you, and you follow the New York Times regularly, you would recognize him as one of their liberals. But it's very interesting. When it comes to Cuba, ideologically, he was in total sync with the uh, administration in the U.S. at that time. 
And what became pretty clear was that it's, he had pretty much formulated the stories prior to ever arriving on the island. So the first thing he did upon arrival in Havana was visit the U.S. interest section. The U.S. interest section is like a, an embassy. We actually do have diplomatic relations with Cuba. They're just not full diplomatic relations. And he met with the political officer. Now, the political officer in any U.S. embassy around the world is the CIA station chief. And he's a very sophisticated guy, and they, he studies the situation very carefully in Cuba. Sorry. And he laid out his economic and political analysis. It's not heavy-handed propaganda. And he suggested a few story ideas to the New York Times. And he said, uh, oh, <clears throat> I know you'll want to do the dissident story. So here's a couple of names and phone numbers of people you might contact. Now, when I talked to, I kind of uh, expressed shock at this idea that, you know, you would go to the CIA to get your story ideas. And, of course, the New York Times guy uh, said, well, I, I'm an independent journalist. I don't take my marching orders from the CIA. I listened to him, and then I made my own decisions. But, of course, what he didn't realize and would not admit is that the story had already been framed, combined with his preconceptions before he arrived, uh, with the fact that the story ideas were suggested, because he did take some of their story ideas, and one pole of the debate was already framed. That is, if you're supposed to present two sides to a story, when, if you've already defined what the story is and what one side is, you've won 80% of the battle because then you're just going out to find what those disreputable Cubans say in defense. <laughs> and, that's, and that's the general attitude. So that accounts for that's one brief description of why we get such distorted news from Cuba. By the way, I, could do, I, I travel to over 100 countries around the world, and I could cite you plenty of examples from elsewhere in the world as well, including the Middle East. Um, but it's very interesting, the uh, dissident story that he, he did. And I'm sure you've all read this. You, do, you don't have to do, get it just in the New York Times. You can get it in virtually any of the mainstream media. It's the heroic uh, but beleaguered independent journalist or independent librarian or independent religious activist or uh, human rights activist, fill in the, the blank there, uh, expresses opposition to uh, the system in Cuba, is fired from his job, um, jailed, tortured, brutally treated by this totalitarian government, once again proving that this horrible communist dictatorship does not re respect human freedoms. You've all read that kind of story. Now, there are very serious problems uh, uh, with human rights in, in Cuba, and I do ex uh, give, devote an entire chapter to it. But the version that we get in the United States is, very, is completely out of sync with reality because you, what you don't learn in that story is the very sources that are being quoted by the mainstream media are on the payroll of the United States. Now, I don't mean that figuratively. I mean that literally, as in cash paid on the barrel head to various dissidents. How do we know this? Well, there was a big scandal last year. And by the way, this is not the only one. This has happened periodically over the period of time where the Santiago Alvarez, a leading terrorist in Miami, and again, I don't use that term lightly, that is somebody who stockpiles arms and is caught with it and does time in jail, uh, and his defense was, I'm not going to use them here, I'm going to use them in Cuba, is a pretty good defi working definition of a terrorist. So this guy, who had spent time in US jails, meets the chief of interest section, Parmley, in, that is the, the highest U.S. diplomat in Cuba. He meets him in the Miami airport. He hands over a big wad of cash. Parmley goes back to Havana, hands it out to the dissidents. How do we know this? Because the Cuban government had a series of press conferences for the foreign press in which they presented email messages and phone taps and text messages. How do we know it's true? Well, one indication was because the dissidents kept complaining about late payments and they weren't going to be able to get their cell, pay their cell phone because the payments was late and what's going on here. And, you know, very realistic uh, interchanges. That was certainly one indication. Uh, and this included people like Mar um, Marta Beatriz Roque, who's a dissident that's quoted all the time. I interviewed her for, for my book, uh, The Damas in Blanca or The Ladies in White which is another group that's uh, supposedly uh, pro protesting human rights uh, because their husbands and uh, sons are uh, political prisoners. But in fact, then they go out every Sunday and they pick it in front of the cathedral. But in fact, they're on the payroll of the United States, as revealed in these um, uh, tape, uh, various uh, tapes and email messages and so on. Now, what's the final proof that this is actually true? Well, when US reporters asked Parmley at a press conference, is this true? 
Um, he not only did not deny it, he said the United States reserves the right to promote democracy in Cuba any way we see fit, i.e., we did it. And there was, no, there was no hubbub in the U.S. No Democrat, no Republican uh, said, you know, boo about it. It just kind of, kind of passed. And it's at least the second or third time something like that has been revealed in Cuba. Now imagine just for a second if the situation had been reversed. What if somebody in Cuba had given a big wad of cash to the Cuban chief of intersection in Washington? He had then distributed it in Washington to American revolutionaries. And when caught at it, said, Cuba reserves the right to support American revolutionaries. Can you imagine the hubbub that would have occurred about that? At a minimum, all the Cuban diplomats would have been expelled from the United States. There would have been calls to bomb Havana. How dare they spread revolution in the US, blah, 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 blah. But when we do it to another country, well, that's, that's perfectly OK. So this double standard, and this is carried out by both Republican and Democratic administrations, uh, is, is absolutely outrageous. The dissident story is not the only one uh, that uh, we can look at to show uh, how the reality is misinterpreted both by the media and as uh, pr basically explained from the US government and then out to the media. Let's take, um, I, I write a lot about the Middle East. Um, my book, The Iran Agenda, looks at in detail the whole history of US-Iranian relations and, and uh, the, the current situation. Um, what's, what's, the, what's our understanding of what's going on in Iran? Why is Iran a threat to the United States? Well, there's a variety of reasons, but probably the biggest one is they've got a nuclear weapons program. And the, obviously, these mad mullahs with atomic weapons are unacceptable. And Israel claims they're just a matter of months from being able to have it, and they've constantly threatened to bomb Iran. Uh, the United States says, well, there's differences about how long it takes, but clearly it's a big threat. And the US, including the Obama administration, have never taken the so-called military option off the table. Well, what's the reality of it? Iran does not have a nuclear weapons program. It's as simple as that. It's another one of these myths, just like the, social, the Buena Vista Social Club or the dissidents in Cuba and so on. Iran has a nuclear power program, that's for sure. They are developing, they have centrifuges to enrich uranium. I personally am in strong disagreement with nuclear power. I don't think it's a good idea in the United States. I don't think it's a good idea in Iran. But if the United States has nuclear power, and France and various other countries around the world, then who is the United States to tell Iran that it can't have a nuclear power program? But that's, of course, not really uh, the immediate dispute. The dispute is, is Iran developing nuclear weapons? Well, the CIA, NSA, and other leading uh, US intelligence agencies say no. In the fall of, to be precise, December of 2007, they issued a national intelligence estimate in which they said Iran does not have a nuclear weapons program. Flat out. Now, it's a little detail. It's so embarrassing. It was so embarrassing to the Bush administration that it's now just kind of passed into history and people have questioned it or whatever. But that NIE has never been repudiated, has never been challenged. There's not been a new one that's come out that says Iran does have a nuclear weapons program. And if, we don't, if you don't believe the CIA, uh, how about uh, the Atomic, International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA, which is a UN body that has inspectors on the ground in Iran. And they say Iran has no nuclear weapons program. And they're the ones who actually can take water and air and soil samples. And you can tell if uh, uranium is being enriched beyond the level it's needed for nuclear power. You have to multiply it by a factor of four or five uh, more level of uh, enrichment to develop nuclear weapons. They've never, ever uh, done that. Not to mention the fact that the myth is that the minute they can enrich some uranium to a high level, they've got a bomb, and, and they're, they're threatening Israel or something like that. I, in fact, if you, if you actually bother to look into the issue, it's a big leap from enriching uranium to having a bomb. It's a big leap to having a bomb and knowing that it'll actually explode. And it's a big leap from there to be able to deliver it, like on a plane or a, particularly a missile. And you, know, you can't just like stick a fuse in the, in the uranium and light it and run away you know, and hold your ears or something. It's a very complicated technology to get all this stuff to work. We know this because South Korea, sorry, North Korea had a nuclear bomb test, and it, and it basically fizzled. And they've been developing nuclear bombs for, uh, for some time. So again, I repeat, Iran does not have a nuclear bomb program. Uh, if the U.S. wants to 
uh, I mean, I, I believe, and I think the Obama administration has taken some steps in the right direction to try and extend uh, negotiations, deal with Iran on a broader issue, stop demonizing it, stop calling it a act, part of the axis of evil, because that's really the only alternative the U.S. has, is to sit down and negotiate and politically resolve these issues. And by the way, Israel is not going to bomb Iran. They can't militarily, let alone politically. They don't have the capability of bombing Iran on their own. They have to have the cooperation of the United States. And even the Bush administration, at the height of its neoconservative mania, uh, did not give Israel uh, uh, the uh, permission to go ahead and bomb Iran. So part, mostly what Israel is doing is using it as a pressure tactic to say, well, we're going to do it anyway, so therefore the United States should take a tougher line on Iran. That's what that's really all about. What are the chances for some change in policy, both towards the Middle East and, uh, and towards Cuba, on the part of the Obama administration? I think it's the most hopeful period we've been in, at least since the late, mid to late 1970s when Jimmy Carter was elected. Uh, the Obama administration has said that it wants to pull troops out from Iraq. Uh, unfortunately, it's also decided to beef up the troops in Afghanistan. Uh, we're going to see all too soon that it's the same kind of quagmire that the U.S. was in Iraq, and that's going to be a huge mistake. Uh, it has offered to negotiate and talk with Iran, which I think is a positive development. We'll see in, if, in fact, it's um, going to be carried through on. And it's also, uh, just in the last uh, week or so, uh, has warmed up some relations, at least uh, rhetorically, with Cuba. And Cuba is a good example, actually, of how the Obama administration is working and what it's going to take for them to significantly change policy. President Obama ran, and no one should be surprised, he is not a progressive Democrat. He is a moderate, middle-of-the-road Democrat, despite all the demonization by the Republicans to try to portray him as some kind of socialist and extremist. That's simply their flailing around and their inability to attract any votes, so they have to try and demonize their enemy. But Obama is not some kind of radical or leftist or even progressive. On the question of Cuba, to again cite this as just one example, uh, during the campaign, he said he would allow Cuban Americans to visit the island uh, without limitation and allow them to send unlimited amounts of money to their relatives on the island. Uh, and he has now gone ahead and done that. And that's it. That was the only change that he had promised in policy on Cuba. Not lifting the embargo, not establishing full diplomatic relations, not expanding trade. It, you know, it was a positive step forward, but a very, very small one. And that was the intention of the Obama administration. I followed all of their pronouncements on Cuba extremely carefully for the last year. And they were willing to make that concession, mainly because Cubans in the South Florida and, and in um, New Jersey very much wanted that. But other than that, there was going to be no changes on Cuba. But the Obama administration doesn't control what happens in the world, believe it or not. I know living here in the United States, we tend to think that we, whatever we want happens, and it don't work that way. So the first thing that happened was, uh, Dick Lugar, a, a Republican from Indiana, blasted U.S. policy towards Cuba and objectively came out to the left of Obama saying that we should relook at our entire policy of Cuba, hinted that we should lift the embargo. Um, why would he do this? Well, he's from a farm state. And the farm lobby and the farm agribusiness interests in this country want to have a lot more trade with Cuba. So you have farm state senators and governors going down on trips to Havana and drinking mojitos and smoking Cuban cigars and trying to sell them wheat and rice and soybeans and chicken wings. Those are the four biggest exports from the United States to Cuba. Cuba the United States is now the number one food exporter in the world to Cuba. $750 million last year. So suddenly Obama is outflanked from the left by a moderate Republican. He goes down to the summit of the Americas in Trinidad and every single president of Latin America, and oh, by the way, prior to that, the, the administration had heard that Cuba was going to be an issue, a big issue. And they issued all these statements saying, oh, Cuba is irrelevant. They're not coming. We're not going to deal with Cuba. Then when the pressure mounted, it was, well, we'll have a, a, a discussion about Cuba. And then it became the number one issue of the uh, uh, summit, not out of choice by the Obama administration, but because of the outrage in Latin America. Uh, every single president from Latin America, including the conservatives, not just the left-wingers, but people like the president of Colombia and the president of Mexico, who are conservatives, the conservative prime minister of Canada, all denounced U.S. policy on Cuba and called for a lifting of the embargo. The United States is the only country in the world that has uh, 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 implements the embargo. Uh, 
the last time the UN voted on this, the UN General Assembly has a vote every year on the issue of the US embargo. You know what the vote was against the United States last time? 184 to 3. 184 countries. There wasn't a single of the traditional US allies in Europe or Asia or Latin America who voted with the US. The three votes for the United States was the United States, because as you know in high school, if you ever ran for office, you have to vote for yourself. And then there was the um, Israel and Vanatau. Now, how many people here can tell me where Vanatau is? That's our staunch ally and heroic uh, 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 stalwart companion. It's a small island in the Pacific. And that's it. Those are the three countries. And there's not a single country in the world that actually observes the US embargo. Israel, which voted with the US, actually trades with Cuba. So the US is totally isolated on this. And it became, it's been isolated for a long time. But this summit of the Americas really made it obvious. They wanted Cuba admitted to the OAS. They wanted an end to the embargo. And, and the, Bush sorry, <laughs> the Obama administration made some rhetorical concessions. Uh, it said, um, it announced these uh, changes involving Cuban-American remittances and travel. Uh, Raul Castro made a statement that all issues are open for negotiation. The U.S. said there were some positive developments there. Now Fidel Castro just yesterday issued a, he's, he writes these um, commentaries for the newspapers there. Uh, it was saying, well, wait a minute, uh, not so fast here. The U.S. has to do some more things first. But at least there's more discussion and dialogue going on, not particularly because the Obama administration wanted it that way, but they've been forced by outside considerations. Grassroots pressure, pressure from the farm lobby and, and others in the US Congress, and internationally. And I think we're going to see a similar pattern uh, on issues of the Middle East, uh, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. The US is not the almighty military power uh, that it thinks it is. The Bush administration has basically wrecked the US power around the world under the guise of expanding it. He has so overextended the US militarily alienated people around the world politically, uh, taxed the country economically into a near uh, depression. You know, there's, in uh, the general discussion about our economic crisis, people like to pretend, well, you've got the war over here and you've got the economic crisis over here and they have absolutely nothing to do with each other. The fact that we spend, what, $10 billion a month, still, even to this day, in Iraq and Afghanistan, why that's unrelated to the economic crisis. You know, like you can spend unlimited amounts of money over here and you just don't happen to have it, for example, to create a decent health plan, or fix Social Security, or any one of a number of other things. They are directly related. We went into a massive economic crisis. One ex very strong factor was the fact that we were spending, uh, wasting untold amounts of billions of dollars, uh, now up to a trillion dollars, on uh, wars that we couldn't win. And it's now becoming obvious that, that we can't win. So I'm actually a, um, I consider myself a sober optimist. And by that, I mean I look soberly at the situation, but I'm optimistic about the potential for change. I really do see new grassroots efforts uh, coming up uh, from people, from students, from uh, trade unions, uh, uh, all of whom are kind of both inspired and angry at the Obama administration, and I think constitute a pressure uh, on the left, from the left. At the same time, there's a tremendous pressure from the right. The Republicans, I mean, did anybody ever watch some of these Fox News or some of these uh, MSNBC commentators on the right or any of these, I mean, these folks are really losing it. Uh, I mean, they're, you know, they're talking, uh, you know, revolution and, uh, you know, we've got to rise up and that used to be the rhetoric of the left, right? Uh, but now I guess it's okay if you're on the right to, to talk about that. So that's not sedition and you're not a terrorist, certainly. You know, uh, but it's a, it's a sign of how completely isolated they are and, and they start, the more isolated they are, the more foaming at the mouth are they become and they have their little teabag parties and stuff like that, right? And, you know, they, they'd go nowhere. Um, and at the same time, uh, there is a, a growing uh, opposition or, you know, movement uh, from the left, a progressive movement. Um, the, it, again, taking the issue of Cuba, I think there's going to be change of U.S. policy. I can't tell you exactly when because the Cuba lobby, which is very powerful, is going to fight this tooth and nail. So you have, on the one side, grassroots groups, uh, such as the Vincerimos Brigades or the Pastors for Peace and others who are committing civil disobedience by openly uh, violating the embargo, going to Cuba saying, yes, we're taking hurricane relief there, you know, prosecute us, and publicizing the fact that U.S. policy is wrong. Then you have folks like uh, who have sister city relationships with Cuba. My hometown of Oakland, California, 
has a sister city relationship with Santiago de Cuba. They've been unable to visit uh, Cuba because of changes uh, by the Bush administration, but I think that's going to ch change under Obama, and people will be able to go down and visit Cuba again, uh, hopefully legally. Hopefully the Obama administration will allow more legal routes to visit Cuba that had been cut off previously. For example, students, greater opportunities for students to go, academics, uh, exchange programs of uh, various kinds of professionals. Cubans are certainly very anxious to visit the United States. The United States people should be able to visit there. I think ultimately this will build into a movement not to allow just Cuban Americans to visit, but any Americans. I mean, exactly, if you're, let's say you disagree with everything I've had to say. Let's say you're a, a, a Republican or a Libertarian or whatever. Um, don't you think Americans should have the right to travel anywhere in the world? I mean, it's a very basic right. If you're uh, for individual rights, you should be for the right to travel to Cuba. And um, that's something that's denied uh, by this big brother government we've got, if you want to look at it in that way. The, I think the final straw in, in the change uh, will come uh, probably from the business community. There's a, a Chamber of Commerce, the um, farm lobby, and even the oil companies are interested in Cuba. Right now, Cuba has, estimates it has 20 billion barrels of oil offshore. Uh, no oil has actually been drilled for, uh, uh, explored and, and discovered yet, but their various geological tests indicate there's lots of offshore oil. They've given out leases to oil companies from Europe and from South America, from China, from Venezuela, from Spain and Norway and various countries, and they're allowing them to drill for oil. But they've held aside some of the leases for U.S. oil companies. So the first time Brazil or somebody strikes oil offshore Cuba, you, should, you just wait and see the hue and cry that's going to come up from the U.S. oil companies saying they want the right to be able to drill offshore as well. And that means they, you have to lift the embargo because they're prohibited from doing so under the terms of the embargo. And all of a sudden we're going to see a, a cascade of different counter-propaganda about why, well, maybe it wouldn't be such a bad idea to lift the embargo and to benefit everybody, et cetera, et cetera. So you, you watch for those developments uh, in, in the months and the years ahead. Um, the, uh, there is a, a right-wing Cuba lobby that opposes this very strongly. We've seen it in just the last couple of weeks. They have three Cuban-American uh, members of the House of Representatives who are ultra-rightists. Uh, they've got a senator from New Jersey and a senator from uh, Florida who are very much in their camp. And every time... They, uh, there's some kind of rapprochement or change in U.S. policy. They say we can't lift the embargo until we have democracy in Cuba. And, you know, I've been to Florida. I've been to South Florida. I've been to Miami. And I've interviewed people down there. And the U.S. Constitution doesn't apply in Florida. You know, the, all these ultra-rightist Cubans um, uh, will literally murder their opponents back in the 70s and 80s, blowing them up or assassinating them. Now they simply politically assassinate them. Uh, uh, virtually every uh, mayor of Miami has been indicted for uh, corruption charges. They steal elections. The, night, the 2000 election uh, was uh, stolen uh, by, against um, Gore and, and for Bush directly as a result of the active participation of ultra-rightist Republicans, including the Cuba, uh, Cuban activists, when they went into a Miami counting booth now, remember, we all remember there was the recounts and all the controversy over that. There was 10,000, 11,000 votes that had not yet been counted. They weren't recounts. They were legal votes that hadn't been counted. They were sitting there in a Miami uh, counting room counting them. The vote was going the wrong way. The Cubans stormed the meeting, literally uh, bu busting down the doors, intimidated the vote counters, and that was the end of that vote. That was it. And Bush only won by, what, seven, 800 votes ultimately? And here were 10,000 votes that were uncounted. So these are exactly the kind of tactics that these guys used to use in Cuba before 1959. You would run, the, you know, yes, there were elections, but they were fraudulent and they were uh, uh, corrupt. And they simply brought those same tactics to Miami with them, which exist down to this day. So when they say we can't, if we lift the, we can't lift the embargo against Cuba until we have democracy in Cuba, and I say we have to lift the embargo uh, against Cuba in order to have democracy in Miami. And I have been encouraged uh, by the uh, grassroots efforts, and I just want to close with a, an actual conversation that I had. I got a call a couple of months ago from a woman named Mina Shapiro, uh, an example of this kind of grassroots effort. Um, she said, uh, hello, uh, uh, Mr. Alec. I said, yes. Said, My name is Mina Shapiro. I'm from the uh, Deerfield Park Beach Progressive Senior Association Planning Committee. Uh, perhaps you've heard of us. 
I said, no, no, uh, tell me about, uh, we're a group of seniors and uh, progressives uh, here in, in the Fort Lauderdale area, and you know, we can see Cuba from here. Uh, that's a little Sailor, uh, Sarah Palin joke. Okay, because uh, <laughs> you can't see Cuba from Fort Lauderdale if you know Florida. Uh, but we'd like you to come out and speak. We have speakers every Saturday morning at 10 a.m. We'd like you to come out and speak. I said, well, uh, okay. Now, I understand uh, you live in the Boston area. And I said, no, no, I live in Oakland, California. Oh, they told me you live in Boston. No, no, I live in Oakland. What have you got against Boston? <laughs> I said, that, I, I like Boston, it's a wonderful city. I, I just happen to live in Oakland. Oh, well, are you free on February 10th, 2010? I said, 2010? Yes. We're snowbirds. We're only here a few months out of the year. Okay, so I'm no dummy. I, you know, I do this sort of thing. So I pick up my day book and I riffle the pages, you know, I, in front of the telephone. You know, I said, well, let me consult my uh, schedule here. Well, yes, I just happen to be free February 10th. 2010, that's a Saturday, isn't it? Yes, it is, thank you. We'll, we'll put you down, we'll, we'll put you in our newsletter, and um, we'll have Bernie pick you up at the airport. He still has his license. <laughs> so I am now scheduled in February 2010 to be the star speaker, Saturday morning, 10 a.m., uh, for the Senior Center. Um, and, and it's just uh, typical of the kind of grassroots efforts that are out there, are groups all over the country who really do want to see a change on Cuba policy and more broadly a change on U.S. foreign policy. And I hope that you join me uh, in being a sober optimist. Thank you so much. I'd be very happy to take questions. Uh, are the younger uh, Cubans in the Miami area, do they have a different attitude? Absolutely. Uh, you have to understand it's both a generational question and also a question of when you came from Cuba. So the folks who, uh, who are now quite old, uh, who came to Florida from Cuba in the uh, early 1960s, many of them were uh, professionals, wealthy. Many of them came with their families intact. Uh, in some cases with their bank accounts intact, and they simply set up shop, whatever corrupt businesses uh, or political activities uh, they were running in Havana, they simply moved it into Miami. Those folks, by and large, uh, are the core of this ultra-right wing um, group that, can, that opposes all change in Cuba, and they're the ones who come out and picket and show up on news conferences every time there's some kind of indication of a change in U.S. policy, who denounce the politicians usually calling them communists and all kinds of other things. Folks who came after, the next big wave of immigrants was in the 1980 Mar Mariel Boatlift. You may remember that um, over, I think it was 125,000 Cubans got on boats and, and came across the streets into Florida. Those folks had been raised under Cuba, Cuban socialism. By and large, they were younger, and they had very different attitudes uh, towards Cuba. Uh, they had benefited from the free education and the free health care in Cuba. Sorry. And obviously, they, they strongly disagreed with Cuba and fled the country, so it's not like they were pro-Castro or something like that, but they had very different attitudes than the earlier generation. And, um, so, and, and that's been true for each subsequent uh, group of Cubans who's come over. They have a very, very different attitudes than those first hardliners. Then you add to that the children of the hardliners and the folks who came in Marial, right? Uh, and you have, a, very, you have a, a massive shift in popular opinion among Cubans in Florida and New Jersey. The, for example, the latest polls show that 55 percent, uh, well, 65 or 67 percent of Cubans uh, in Florida oppose, uh, would favor um, any American traveling to Cuba, so a lift on the travel ban. 55 percent support lifting the embargo in its entirety. So that, that, if you know anything about the attitudes of, of Cuban Americans, that is a massive shift from years past when overwhelming support for the embargo was there. They, like everybody else, realize that the embargo has failed. It has not worked. And it's now, the, the, the disconnect is, however, there's a huge shift in popular opinion, but the leadership of the Cuban community is still these ultra-rightists. And that's largely because they have the money, they have the political organization, they're able to turn out people to vote, uh, they're able to intimidate uh, opponents. Uh, 
So there's a big fight going on in the Cuban community in Miami, and it's not a, it's not a fair fight if it was simply majority. That's why I say, that's why I call for democracy in Miami, because you'd see very big changes. But if you're worried about getting shot or losing your job, that's exactly the kind of stuff they, they accuse Castro of doing in Cuba, but they've been carrying it out for years in Miami. The question was about the <laughs> dry foot, wet foot policy of the U.S. and whether that ends up discriminating against black, or, uh, black Cubans. First of all, let me explain what the policy is. Um, any Cuban who is, manages to touch foot on U.S. soil is automatically fast-tracked for a green card and citizenship, unlike any other immigrant anywhere else in the world. If you're Cuban, if you can prove you're Cuban, you come to the United States, you, you land on a beach, um, you're given welfare benefits, uh, help with housing, education, health care, you're given Medicare, uh, and within one year you can uh, get your green card, and then within five years of being there you can become a citizen. That's unlike the policy towards any, any uh, other immigrant group. Uh, imagine, you, uh, you know how Mexicans are treated, or you know, people from Dominican Republic, or anywhere else in the world. Um, if, however, you don't manage to touch, if you're just in a raft or a boat, and you don't touch U.S. shore, you're supposed to be returned to Cuba. And so what you're alluding to is that the, uh, because of racist attitudes and other factors in the uh, uh, customs, or not the customs, the uh, Coast Guard and the others, uh, the, if you're a black Cuban, you're more likely to be returned. Uh, I think also sometimes, you know, like in the case of, you all know that case of Elian Gonzalez, right? Okay, so his family uh, came with him, and, what, and this often happens is that uh, Cubans who are out fishing or whatever find people, bring them to shore, and then claim they found them on shore. And I'm absolutely sure that this discrepancy between blacks and whites happens there, because most of the Cubans in, in South Florida are white, historically. And the, or at least the people with the boats and, and the wherewithal to go out, or the planes, et cetera. So I'm sure that's, uh, that continues to go on, yeah. What does the embargo cover and not, and how come we can sell farm goods? Okay. In 2000, there was a big movement in Congress to eliminate the embargo entirely. A lot of the impetus came from the farm lobby because they wanted to sell products to Cuba. The Cuba lobby fought back uh, viciously and effectively and forged a compromise. Instead of lifting the embargo altogether, they allowed, changed the law to allow U.S. farm product producers, cattlemen, uh, vintners, whatever, any food product, to sell things to Cuba, but not to allow Cuba to sell things here in the U.S. It's a one-way street. As someone said, it's the, every protectionist dream, right? Because you're protected from imports from another country, but they're forced to take your product at your prices. And not only to sell the products, but that the Cubans have to pay for the um, products in advance. Normally, uh, in international trade anywhere else in the world, you order products from a second country, you put up a letter of credit, the, the products are arrive, you check, make sure they're all there, et cetera, et cetera, then you put through the word and, and the payment is made. That's not true with Cuba. You have to, in essence, write a check or deposit the money in the United States in advance of the sale or at the time of the sale, and then however many months later it arrives in Cuba. So it's obviously it's grossly distorted uh, trade, unfair to Cuba. And mainly it's unfair because Cuba has a problem with hard currency. They need to sell more things abroad. And if the U.S. lifted the embargo, uh, it would help the Cuban economy because they'd be able to sell sugarcane and uh, presumably pharmaceutical uh, drugs, which are a big uh, export earner for them, nickel, uh, cigars, rum, whatever, to the United States, which would then help them both to buy more things from the United States as well as to buy things from other countries. So that's the, that's the, the twist in the embargo. Uh, are the Cubans in Cuba living a comfortable life, and how do they feel about Castro? Uh, simple question, complicated answer. Uh, and I devote a couple chapters in my, in my book uh, uh, to that. In Cuba, uh, you do not see the extremes of wealth and poverty like you see all over Latin America, or indeed in this country. There's no homeless in Cuba. There's nobody dying for lack of medical care. Uh, education is free, health care is free, uh, virtually no rent, very low cost utilities, um, subsidized culture, so for the cost of a ticket of 20 cents, you can see world-class um, opera, symphonies, jazz, popular music, you name it, film, 20 cents. If you're a foreigner, you pay the equivalent of $5. Uh, 
and it's cost, uh, what $5 to us is about what 20 cents is to Cuban. So you have all of these benefits that you don't have anywhere else, certainly in the third world. At the same time, there's lots of shortages in the system. Uh, you're, you go to your polyclinic uh, for uh, a medical checkup, uh, and some days they don't have x-ray films, and you get free drugs, but the, uh, they're out of that drug, and you go halfway across town to another pharmacy, and they don't have the drug, and there's all kinds of those, those kind of shortages. Cubans are guaranteed a food basket of rationed food. So in theory, you go into a special store with a ration card, and, which every Cuban has, and uh, you get, you know, I don't know, half a dozen eggs and a liter of milk and bread and meat and cooking oil, you know, a basket of food. Except when you go in there, and I did this because I went in on a regular basis, most of the time, most of the stuff wasn't there. <laughs> So you might get lucky one day and get cooking oil, but there's no eggs. And the next day you might get lucky and there's eggs, but there's no uh, yucca or something. Uh, so in order to buy food, you have to, you can't rely just on the rationed stores. You have to go out into the, and they do have farmer's markets, and they do have supermarkets, but the costs are higher. And if you're earning money only in pesos, you basically can't get enough of what you need in the course of the month. If you have access to hard currency, for example, you have relatives in Miami who send you even a couple hundred bucks a month, or you work in the tourism industry, so therefore you have access to tips and hard currency, you can do fine, because you can afford everything at these farmers markets, and prices are very low. I mean, if you go there with US dollars, you can live like a king, so because everything is so uh, inexpensive. But it's expensive if you're earning only pesos, uh, which the majority of uh, Cubans do. So you have this very strange situation where a cancer surgeon makes less real money than a taxi driver, because the taxi driver gets tipped in dollars. So you find cancer surgeons driving taxis. It's crazy. And everybody realizes that the system is upside down. So there is a lot of criticism, and that's why this whole thing about the dissident story is another phony. Uh, if you want to meet some dissidents, walk out on the street of Cuba, in Havana or Santiago or any of the cities, uh, and spend about five minutes talking to people. <laughs> and you'll find a lot of people with a lot of gripes against the government. Uh, that mainly on economic issues. People don't talk about, oh, we want multi-parties or something like that, or an independent judiciary. That's not the The issue is the economy. What is the government going to do so that we don't have, it's not a struggle for us to get food by the end of the month? And um, people do not criticize Castro, although uh, openly. Uh, that basically, in terms of civil liberties and, and uh, you know, political discussion, you can criticize the government kind of up to a point. There's an invisible line, and you don't, you don't cross that line. And one of the lines you don't cross is, is criticizing the top leadership. You can criticize the bureaucracy. You can criticize local officials or even, you know, the head of your, whatever, you know, your, your factory, whatever. But you don't criticize the top leadership. Um, and before you get too worked up about, you know, how repressive the government is, I make an analogy to um, in this country. You know, we're free to criticize our, our president, our politicians. That's good. But if what, if what if I was a reporter and I came to your workplace? And I said, give me your honest opinion about your boss. You would, there would be a long pause <laughs> before you answered, wouldn't there? Because your survival at work depends on what your answer would be. So you might say some, mumble something like, oh, he's pretty good. <laughs> whatever, whatever you think, right? Well, that's pretty much how the Cubans <laughs> react to uh, talks, talks about their top leadership. And, until you know folks. And then, then you get people all over the map. But even saying all that and all the very real problems that exist in Cuba, this, the Communist Party and the Cuban government have substantial support. Every expert I've talked to, every Cuban I've talked to, says the benefits of the Cuban Revolution are still strong enough that a significant number of people continue to support the government with all its flaws. Then there's a significant number of people who don't, and a, and a bunch of people in between. And the exact percentages of, on all those numbers, I don't think anybody knows, frankly. The question was about the... Um, agricultural production in Cuba. It's actually something I, I meant to go into more uh, in my original talk, but Cuba is now the largest experiment in organic farming in the world. And uh, they ha took a tremendous blow in the period 90, 91, 92, 93, when the Soviet Union collapsed. It had been subsidizing Cuba uh, with uh, oil and uh, food products and clothing, all kinds of stuff, and to the tune of billions of dollars a year. And it kept the economy afloat, including its, uh, its food production. When the Soviet Union collapsed, that subsidy was gone, and the Cuban economy went into a tailspin during that period. It, it reached bottom in 93. 
And I was there at that time, and I saw, you know, there were electric blackouts, and there were you know, gasoline for your cars, and the buses wouldn't run. It was a real, a real uh, economic disaster. Part of that was the food production dropped, because they didn't have chemical fertilizers and um, uh, pesticides that they had been dependent on before. So they did a crash course in, uh, out of necessity in organic farming, because they had no choice. And it, it has become the largest experiment in the world in organic farming. Uh, they had turned around within a matter of a couple of years. They brought their uh, vegetable production back up to pre-90 levels. It's now, it, it took maybe five years. Um, and it's the purest experiment in organic farming in the world. Why do I say that? Here in the US, you know if you go to a supermarket, uh, an organic stalk of broccoli might cost twice or three times as much as a non-organic, right? Now, I've talked to a lot of organic farmers. It don't cost twice or three times as much to make that organic broccoli. It costs some more, because there's more labor and various other things, but it don't cost two or three times more. What the supermarkets and the distributors have figured out is there's a niche, and we can charge a whole bunch of money for organic, product, for organic produce and pocket the profit, because it ain't going to the organic farmer, by and large. We can make a lot of profit because people think that organic produce is good for you, so it must be more expensive, so we'll charge as high as the market will go. And the result is, for most working people, they don't buy organic because they can't afford it. It's perfectly logical, but the, the supermarkets don't care because they're making a lot of profit off of a small amount of uh, organic products. In Cuba, there is absolutely no price differential between organic and non-organic. That's it, it's the same price. So there's no profit motive driving the, uh, the niche marketing of organic produce. It's a pure question of, can we produce enough food to feed the country? And will organic methods do it best, or will some use of chemicals do it best? That's the question. And there's a huge debate in Cuba about that. Because after 15, 20, almost 20 years now, of, uh, of, for instance, the collapse of the Soviet Union, they're able to afford to buy some chemicals now. They can buy chemical fertilizer and pesticides. If any of you are, I don't know if any of you are, are organic farmers or gardeners or whatever, you know it's very difficult to use all organic methods. And you know, you might lose your tomato crop one year to pesty, pesty little pests or something. Well, now imagine if your whole country loses <laughs> a certain crop. Uh, it, it has very serious consequences. So there's a very big debate in Cuba about uh, people who feel very strongly you have to go all organic all the time because it's better for your health and it's better for the environment. And those who say, yes, we should use organic methods, but you know, we've got to use limited amounts of pesticides because we just lose too much production otherwise. And there's a big debate. And it's, you know what's really interesting? Remember, in Cuba, it's a totalitarian dictatorship where you cannot disagree with the government. And you're thrown in jail for a voicing opposition. Remember? We talked about that earlier. Well, I've never seen an organic farmer thrown in jail <laughs> for, for advocating the wrong line on organic food. It's a very lively, robust debate. It's just not the debate the US wants to see. The US wants to see a debate about, should we bring the Miami Cubans back to rule this country or not? That's the free speech they want to see. Whereas actual debates that actually affect the people of Cuba, which go on freely, well, that's just ignored. So it's a, it's a fascinating debate. I don't, uh, I don't, I'm not an organic farmer. I don't profess to have a, you know, uh, it, it, I listen to both sides. I reported it in my book. Uh, you should read about it if you're more interested in uh, agriculture and organic farming. Yes, the U.S. will eventually have to give up Guantanamo. Uh, it'll, be, it'll take a while. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you know the history of this at all, but we know Guantanamo today because of the illegal detention and uh, torture that goes on there. But the U.S. stole Guantanamo a long time ago. Um, in 1898, the rebels in Cuba had fought the Spanish army to a standstill. They were on the road to achieving their independence. When the U.S. stepped in, promised the Cuban rebels independence, uh, and the, the rebels went along with it. The U.S. stepped in, defeated the Spanish army in a matter of months, and then proceeded to uh, ignore the rebels and bring in white Cubans from the United States who had been living in the United States to come rule uh, Cuba. The rebels had been uh, mulatto and, and mixed race folks, uh, along with uh, blacks and whites, etc. Uh, some of the leadership had been black. Um, and the U.S. basically planned to keep Cuba as a colony as it has done with Puerto Rico. But the people in Cuba wouldn't go for that. There was a lot of uh, clamoring for independence. So the US kind of crafted a deal uh, to grant formal independence while still maintaining control. And the US passed something called the Platt Amendment and forced the Cuban 
uh, people writing the Constitution for the new Cuba to uh, include it. The Platt Amendment said the U.S. controls customs duties in all of Cuba. It um, allows the U.S. to intervene militarily anytime it wants, unilaterally. And the U.S. then proceeded to do that three different times in the 1900s. And it gave the U.S. Guantanamo as a naval coaling station. And then the agreement was re renewed in the 1930s but under duress. So basically, we stole it fair and square. And that's the U.S. argument about, uh, you know, you signed a document, so <laughs> nan, nan, nan. Um, but of course, that's the same basis on which the U.S. stole the Panama Canal and ultimately negotiated the return of that. It hasn't been a disaster. The Panama Canal is functioning fine. Uh, the U.S. should give back Guantanamo as well. As a practical matter, uh, sometime after the U.S. lifts the embargo, after it reestablishes re normal diplomatic relations, after uh, a lot of the hubbub that that will create dies down, then they'll and, and settles issues of claims and monetary uh, uh, differences between the two countries. Then somewhere after that, they'll get around to Guantanamo. By by social uh, media tools, you're free like Facebook and that, that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's it's like the Cuban Americans, it's a generational thing. I just got on Facebook, you know, only 15 years after it started or something. Um, my, I, I can only tell you anecdotally. Um, I, I don't have a, an overview on that question. My sense is, having spoken around the country to various colleges and so on, is that young people very much make use of those tools. Twitter and Facebook and all of the similar sites is a great way to communicate with people and help organize. I know some of events I've spoken at were done entirely via email. Everybody was notified under, by email and they came out. Um, they're not, it's, not, it's, a, it's a tool. It's not a magic bullet. Uh, in the old days, we used to have leaflets and phone trees, right? And they work very effectively when you're doing a good job of organizing. And when you're doing a lousy job, the unlimited Facebook accounts <laughs> are not going to help. Um, so yes, I think uh, uh, my impression is that young people are definitely making use of those uh, as organizing tools. OK, well, thank you very much for coming out. I'll be happy to. Be happy to sign books in the back.